Thank you everyone for joining us today for our presentation on the recent wave of global sanctions in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. My name is Eric Cadell, and I am one of the leaders of Sullivan and Cromwell's economic sanctions and financial crime practice. Joining me today are four colleagues who are also members of that practice. Sharon Cohen-Levin, who's also a member of our firm's criminal defense and investigations group. Craig Jones from our London office and the leader of our European economic sanctions practice. Adam Zubin, who many of you know from his nearly 13 year tenure at the US Department of the Treasury, where he served as acting undersecretary for terrorism and financial intelligence, and the director of Treasury's Office of Foreign uh, Assets Control or OFAC, and as well as senior advisor to the undersecretary for terrorism and financial intelligence. And finally, Menon Scales, an associate in our Washington office, who is an expert in and a key member of our economic sanctions and financial crime practice. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that the underlying reason we're here today is the tragic events unfolding in Ukraine. Like all of you, we are horrified and worried by the loss of innocent life and by the tragic scenes we're seeing every day on the news. We all hope for a peaceful resolution of this situation as soon as possible. Of course, economic sanctions are one tool that governments may use to seek to influence behavior. But in this case, as the threat and then the rollout of sanctions over the initial days following Russia's first incursion into Ukraine failed to influence Russia's behavior, Sanctions are now being used to punish, to impose massive costs on Russia as a consequence of its continued actions in Ukraine. The volume of sanctions has been enormous. On an almost everyday basis, new sanctions are being announced and implemented by the United States, the European Union, and the United Kingdom in a closely coordinated effort with cooperation from Switzerland, Canada, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and others. There's a significant volume of new sanctions, many of which come with significant complexity. During today's program, we're going to provide for you a high level summary of the sanctions and other measures that have been implemented to date, all of which was done against the background of existing Ukraine and Russia related sanctions that were first adopted in 2014 in response to Russia's eventual annexation of the Crimea region and has been enhanced several times since then, both through executive branch action in the United States and congressional legislation in the United States. We have organized the current sanctions measures into four principal areas and then two secondary areas. The four principal areas are financial sector sanctions, sanctions that restrict investment and trading, import and export controls, and then targeting of particular persons and entities. The two secondary areas or sanctions are airspace restrictions and then sanctions specifically targeting Belarus for its cooperation and support of the Russian effort. After we, we review those areas, we will talk about what's next, and our focus will be on three principal topics. First, expected enforcement of these new measures as we go forward. Second, what sanctions are left to implement and what might we see over the coming days, weeks, and months? Finally, with a focus on the US in particular, what are the prospects for a robust secondary sanctions campaign? And what are the prospects for Congress seeking to add legislative solutions to the mix? So we have a lot to cover today, but before we get into the details of all of these sanctions and areas announced and implemented to date, I'd like to turn it over to Adam Zubin and ask him to share his perspective on this effort. Adam. Thanks very much, Eric. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. 
Uh, as Eric said, these have been dramatic events. And I can say personally, having now been in the sanctions field for 20 years, I have never seen a sanctions campaign like this. So let me just share two opening observations. One is the objectives of this campaign changed very quickly. On Thursday, the 26th of February, as Russia invaded Ukraine, we saw the long awaited rollout of an allied sanctions effort. And Western capitals had been talking about this publicly and telegraphing privately to Russia that there would be very serious sanctions. Those sanctions included, I would say, powerful export controls as well as targeting of some of Russia's largest banks. But I descri would describe the purpose of those sanctions as to change Putin's behavior. And so there were a number of major sanctions that were withheld as a means to reshape his thinking, to say, there's a lot of pain that could be coming your way, but we're holding it in reserve. That was Thursday. And by that weekend, what we saw was um, accelerating to really the ultimate stages of a sanctions campaign, sanctioning the head of state, Vladimir Putin and his foreign minister, pulling Russian banks that were targeted off of SWIFT and sanctioning the central bank, which for finance ministries is typically something that's viewed as sacred, almost like the way embassies are viewed by foreign ministries. But we went there and we went there with allies with breathtaking speed. That shift in 48 hours, just to give you perspective, took us about 18 months in the Iran context to accelerate from where we were on Thursday to where we were on Sunday. As Eric says, I think the objectives now are really to decimate the Russian economy, to make it harder for Russia to prosecute its war effort, to perhaps uh, increase domestic pressure on Putin through elites or through uh, the population taking to the streets in protest. And then finally, to send a deterrent message to any other power, potentially including China, that would dare to follow in Russia's path. That's what I see as the objectives right now. And by all accounts, the, the impacts on Russia's currency uh, and financial sector have been as powerful as we were expecting. The uh, sanctions effort has been unprecedented in three ways. First, uh, since World War II, we have not targeted an economy this large. We're talking about Russia, the 10th or 11th largest economy in the world. This is not Sudan, Cuba, or even Iran. Second, as I noted, the speed with which we accelerated through the sanctions not only was unprecedented, but clearly took Russia by surprise. And their efforts to diversify their foreign reserves, spread them across various jurisdictions, did not prepare them for the breadth of this coalition and you have more than 50% of Russia's foreign reserves now immobilized. And then finally, the willingness to take on sacrifice. The steps that the EU has announced were unthinkable two weeks ago, to bring down their gas imports by two thirds, the UK and the US saying we're cutting off Russian energy imports altogether. These are going to be very costly for consumers and voters in these jurisdictions. And I think these steps speak to not just the commitment of the governments involved, but the tremendous level of support that they're getting from their populations, at least at this stage. With that, I uh, turn it to Craig to share the perspective from Europe. Thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, as in the US, in the scope and speed with which new measures have been announced in the EU and in the UK is unprecedented. I think before the first wave of sanctions, there was widespread skepticism that the EU would be able to bring along all of the member states. Um, we were seeing a lot of statements around Germany wanting to protect its energy supply. There were statements around Italy looking to protect the export of luxury goods. I mean, all those types of statements turned out to be misplaced and the EU in a short period of time it presented a remarkably united front. Um, we also saw that the UK was very vocal uh, in promoting sanctions before the first wave came in. And it has largely moved in step with the EU and the US. Uh, one point to note is here in the UK, the government has claimed that it's hindered in its ability to target individuals 
because of the designation requirements in the Sanctions and Money Laundering Act, which was introduced post-Brexit. Um, that is a slightly difficult point for some of us to understand, uh, because the provisions that seem to be of concern simply restate requirements from the European Human Rights Legislation, which is also applicable to the EU. But in any event, Adam, um, you know, the government is considering primary legislation now to address that concern, and we should expect to see you know, continuing uh, new sanctions over time from the UK too. Great. Thank you, Craig. And, and Sharon, before we uh, launch into the, the details of the various sanctions areas, I'd, I'd like to ask if, if you have any thoughts to share in particular on uh, the interplay of this wave of sanctions and AML requirements and enforcement coming down the road, especially for financial institutions. Um, yes, thank you so much, Eric. Um, you're, that is exactly the issue, an issue of concern, is the expansive um, Russian sanctions impose AML obligations, anti-money laundering obligations on financial institutions. Under the US anti-money money laundering laws, the Bank Secrecy Act, um, financial institutions, which include banks, broker dealers, money service businesses, crypto exchanges, they're required to identify and report suspicious activity, including activity associated with um, sanctions evasions, and also to conduct risk-based customer due diligence to identify sanctioned individuals and entities. Um, the U.S. government has strongly encouraged financial institutions to use all available tools to identify hidden Russian and Belarusian assets, and the U.S. government has placed um, significant focus on identifying the assets of the oligarchs. Um, you see on the news, um, you know, all the stories and commentary on the oligarchs and their mega, their um, mega yachts, their airplanes. There is a real focus on, as Adam mentioned, you know, really bringing down, you know, bringing support um, against Putin. And part of that proposal is going after the oligarchs, the people and entities that have supported him. So to that end, the Department of Justice has set up a, in the U.S. Department of Justice has set up a task force called Klepto Capture, which among other things, goal is to seize and forfeit those assets, those mega yachts, the assets of the oligarchs. Um, this identification, in particular, the identification of the um, assets of the Russian oligarchs or Russian elite, um, they are they present real challenges to financial institutions. They've had years of um, practice hiding their assets through shell companies and complex ownership structures using nominees, um, relying upon all different types of enablers to be able to deeply bury their assets. So it's not apparent to a financial institution and to others dealing with them who exactly is the ownership of the property. So, and who is an oligarch and who is not just, it's not just who is included on these, um, on the sanctions list, but who will be included are gonna be concerns to financial institutions. The list, as you've all mentioned, is rapidly growing and expanding. So um, this is presenting real challenge, will present real challenges to financial institutions to dig through this and identify who the, um, who the owners are to be able to identify those assets owned by not just sanctioned entities, but to evaluate their risk to determine whether or not to maintain customer relationships for the future. So for financial institutions, the imposition of this, this broad base of sanctions is a time to ensure you have not just an effective sanctions program, but an effective anti-money laundering program. And to ensure that you actually know who your customer is. And most importantly, if you're identifying suspicious activity, reporting that suspicious activity. Great. Well, thank you very much, Adam, Craig, Sharon, for all those great perspectives to start us off. And, and with that, I think, Manon, I'd like to turn the floor over to you to start us on the overview of the sanctions that have been announced and is implemented to date. Great. Thanks very much, Eric. 
Um, so as Eric mentioned, I'll, I'll start with an overview of sort of where things stand today, particularly from a U.S. perspective, uh, and then turn it back to, to Eric and on to Craig to talk about um, the EU and the U.K. So as, as Eric noted, and just to briefly set the stage, uh, this, this recent flurry of, of sanctions comes against the backdrop of, of sanctions that have been in place in both the U.S. and, and Europe since Russia's annexation of Crimea in, in 2014. Uh, and those sanctions took the form of broad prohibition with respect to transactions involving Crimea, blocking property of certain senior Russian government officials and oligarchs, prohibiting U.S. persons from engaging in various transactions to finance certain persons operating in various sectors of the Russian economy, uh, and prohibiting U.S. persons from participating in the primary market for Russian sovereign debt. Uh, these latest sanctions are, of course, a, a significant expansion of the existing Russian sanctions regime. So one of the, the first actions that President Biden took, which was in response to Putin's decision to recognize the so-called Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic uh, as independent states, was to issue new Executive Order 14065, which broadly prohibits transactions in or involving those two regions, much as the sanctions adopted in 2014 with respect to Crimea, the Crimea region did. Um, pursuant to a, a simultaneously issued general license, parties do have until 12.01 uh, a.m. On, on March 23rd to wind down existing transactions in those regions. And since the issuance of that first executive order 14065, the bulk of the action has really taken place under the authority of an existing executive order 14024, which is the executive order targeting certain specified harmful foreign activities of the Russian government. So I'll start with the sanctions imposed on the Russian banking and financial sector. As most are likely aware, over the course of the past couple of weeks, OPEC has designated a number of Russian financial institutions, including VEB, Russia's Economic Development Bank, PSB, the state-owned bank that primarily finances Russia's defense industry, Novicom Bank, which operates in the defense sector and is owned by the Russian defense company Rostec, VTB Bank, which is the second largest financial institution in Russia, and Otkriti and Sovcom Bank, the seventh and ninth largest financial institutions in Russia. So, of course, for these designated financial institutions, their property and interest in property that are subject to U.S. jurisdiction are, are blocked, and U.S. persons are prohibited from dealing with them. OFAC did issue some wind-down general license, licenses covering most of these designated financial institutions. So US persons have about a month from the date of designation to wind down existing transactions with these institutions. Uh, general licenses 9A and 10A also provide a three-month authorization for, for US persons to, um, to divest to non-US persons debt or equity of these institutions that was issued before the date of their designations and also to wind down pre-existing derivatives contracts uh, to which one of the designated institutions is a party or that are linked to the debt or equity of these designated institutions. And finally, OFAC also issued a general license uh, permitting transactions until June 24th that involve one of the designated financial institutions and that are related to energy. Uh, and finally, just to note that the two banks that operate in the defense sector, PSB and Novicom Bank, are not covered by any of these uh, general licenses. Uh, in addition to the designations under Executive Order 14024, OPEC has taken some other actions in the banking and financial sector that aren't quite designations, but, but ultimately do end up with a similar effect. Uh, with respect to Spurbank, Russia's largest financial institution, OFAC issued Directive 2 under Executive Order 14024, which prohibits U.S. financial institutions from opening or maintaining a correspondent account or payable through account for Spurbank, and also prohibits them from processing any transactions involving Spurbank. Spurbank is covered by the general licenses that I mentioned earlier, so General License 10A that permits the wind down of pre-existing derivatives contracts to which it's a party or that are linked to its debtor equity, and also the General License 8A that permits transactions that are related to energy uh, through to June 24th. 
Uh, similarly, with respect to the Russian Central Bank, the National Wealth Fund, and the Russian Ministry of Finance, OFAC issued a Directive 4 under Executive Order 14024, which prohibits US persons from engaging in any transactions involving those entities. The Russian Central Bank is covered by the General License 8A that, that permits transactions related to energy. And all three of the parties are covered under uh, General License 10A, permitting the wind down of a pre-existing derivatives contracts, uh, repurchase agreements, and reverse repurchase agreements entered into with those parties. Uh, also, OFAC also issued several other general licenses um, permitting transactions involving the central bank, the National Wealth Fund, and the Ministry of Finance in cases where the, the party's sole function is just to act as an operator of a clearing or settlement system, um, and also a general license permitting U.S. persons to pay fees and purchase and receive permits, licenses, registrations from those parties to the extent uh, ordinarily incident and necessary to, to the person's day-to-day -day operations in Russia. So that's a, a quick and, and high level overview. I'll, I'll turn it back to Eric and I think on to Craig to discuss the EU and UK uh, financial sector sanctions. Thanks Manon. Uh, let me jump in on the EU and the UK. Uh, the scope and, and the way that um, the sanctions work is similar. I won't go through every one of them um, quite the way Manon did because we, we just won't have enough time. I think one, one thing to note is that from an EU perspective, the way that it tends to work is that within the regulation itself, you will find that there is a sort of equivalent of a wind down type period, uh, which the EU calls a derogation that will be embedded in the regulation itself rather than through separate licensing, whereas the UK um, has adopted a general license approach and we've seen general licenses coming out of the UK covering some of the activities that we'll talk about. Um, frankly, the UK doesn't seem quite as together yet. OFSI um, general licenses have been corrected. There have been mistakes in them. Um, sometimes they, they're not issued at the same time as the um, underlying restriction. So we've got a little bit of a way to go to get to the same level of um, professionalism that uh, we see in the US, but uh, you know the principles are the same. So in terms of what financial sector sanctions do we see in the EU and the UK? The main one is the asset freeze, um, which can be applied to both individuals and companies. A significant issue that we've seen again and again over the last few days is how to treat a company that has a shareholder which is targeted, but the shareholding is lower than 50%. Um, you know, we don't just have a straight 50% test in the EU and the UK, you also have to look at control. Um, and when a control analysis is required, it's going to be very difficult for counterparties to be able to know whether or not control exists. Um, we have seen over the last few days, affected companies really taking the initiative in going out and providing information packs, and in some cases, even legal opinions to their counterparties to try and demonstrate that the company itself is not caught as a result of sanctions applied to the shareholders. Um, you know, many counterparties are still, um, having received these packs, looking for some sort of specific individual assurance through, you know, written letters addressed directly to them or covenants in contracts, and or they might be speaking directly to the um, national competent authority in their uh, member state, asking for some sort of clarification or authorization there. Even in situations where there is no control by a sanctioned entity of a company, anybody dealing with that company um, still needs to make sure that in dealing with it, the counterparty is not indirectly making funds or economic resources available to the sanctioned shareholder, because that is also prohibited under the EU rules. And funds and economic resources are defined very broadly so that taken together, they cover just about anything of value. In addition to these sort of asset freeze issues, there is separate financial sanctions, the aim of which is to restrict trading in securities. And we've seen direct application to Russia, to the government of Russia and the central bank, but in addition, certain other named companies. Now, these are listed separately from the asset freeze targets. Um, they're mainly banks, energy companies, companies in the defense uh, military sector. And an important distinction here is that 
Um, you know, just because a company is on the asset freeze list, it doesn't necessarily restrict secondary trading in the shares of that company. Um, but these restrictions, these further restrictions are aimed squarely at preventing um, trading. From April the 12th, uh, so not yet, from April the 12th, there's going to be a ban on providing listing or trading services in the EU for securities of a Russian company that's over 50% public ownership. Um, and in addition to all of those measures, it's generally prohibited to make any new loan available to any of the companies whose shares are subject to trading restrictions. There's one sort of final sort of miscellaneous pot of financial sanctions, which, um, you know, some of these are quite novel and have been brought in specifically in relation to the developments over the last few weeks and things you don't normally see in these types of financial sanctions um, instruments. So we've got a ban on involvement in managing reserves or assets of the Central Bank of Russia. There's a restriction on institutions accepting deposits from Russians. Um, and even where they can accept this deposits, there may be new reporting requirements. And these attach in particular to uh, Russians who may have uh, golden passports or golden visas in place with member states. Um, and those, by the way, are also being scrapped. Uh, there is a prohibition on sending any euro denominated notes into Russia. Any central security depository in the EU um, will be banned from providing any services uh, for securities issued after the 12th of April to any Russian. And finally, we're seeing a, a ban from the 12th of April on selling any euro denominated securities to a, a Russian person. Back to you, Eric. Great, thank you, Craig. Uh, Adam, you, you know, just one other measure. I know uh, it, it received just a lot of attention in the press and, and uh, it, you know, people may have just some questions about the significance. Could I just ask you to, to give a quick discussion of, of what happened with the, uh, with the SWIFT system and the cutoff of certain Russian banks? Yeah, I'm happy to just, uh, you know, two sentences on that. Um, SWIFT, as this audience will likely know, is the cross-border messaging system, secure messaging system that banks use to communicate with other banks. Uh, in some countries it's used domestically, but it is basically the system that's used cross-border. So cutting a Russian bank, as the West has now done with respect to sanctioned Russian banks, cutting it off from SWIFT means it can't communicate in the traditional accepted way with banks in other jurisdictions. There are exceptions to this, of course, and uh, China and Russia will remain connected through a bilateral mechanism they've created. Um, what I found most notable about it is the Europeans, where SWIFT is headquartered, have traditionally been completely allergic to talking about SWIFT cutoffs as a sanctions measure. They view this as a utility and something that needs to be protected from politics and foreign policy. So here too, you just see yet another reflection of how severe the concern is in the EU, uh, that they were ready to take this measure and took it unanimously. All the EU member states had to back this for the SWIFT sanction to go into place. Yeah, great. I, and, and I think that's exactly right. The, uh, the, that, that is the, the very notable aspect of, of that action. Uh, well, great. So, so that pretty much sums up the uh, financial sector sanctions. If, uh, if I could go back to you, man, and ask you to talk a little bit about the uh, investment sanctions that we're seeing. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Um, so in terms of investment related sanctions, uh, again, back to the, the Russian Central Bank, the National Wealth Fund and the Russian Ministry of Finance, even prior to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, Directive 1 under Executive Order 14024 prohibited US financial institutions from participating in the primary market for ruble or non-ruble denominated bonds issued after June 14th, 2021 uh, by these parties and, and also from lending ruble or non-ruble denominated funds uh, after June 14th uh, to, to these parties. In connection with, with this latest round of sanctions, OFAC amended Directive 1, now Directive 1A, uh, to further prohibit US financial institutions from participating in the secondary market uh, for ruble or non-ruble denominated bonds, in this case issued after March 1st, uh, 2022 by, by any of these parties. 
uh, direct and of course directive four's subsequent prohibition on on engaging in any transactions involving these entities generally subsumes the restrictions on on lending and participating in the primary bond market, um, but would also generally prohibit the receipt of interest payments or dividends on on debt or equity, uh, including bonds issued prior to March first that U.S. financial institutions may have acquired in the secondary market. Um, so OFAC did amend General License 9, now General License 9A, um, in connection with the issuance of Directive 4 to provide that U.S. persons uh, are permitted to receive interest, uh, dividend, or maturity payments until May 25th uh, in connection with the debtor equity of, of these entities, um, so long as it was issued before that, that March 1st, um, 2022 date. OFAC also issued uh, Directive 3 under Executive Order 14024, which prohibits U.S. persons or persons in the United States from, from dealing in debt of longer than 14 days maturity and new equity, in each case issued on or after March 26th uh, by certain identified Russian entities. Um, and these en the identified entities subject to the Directive 3 prohibitions include Spurbank, and also a number of other large Russian financial institutions that are not designated under uh, Executive Order 14024, such as uh, Gazprom Bank, Alpha Bank, and Ru the Russian Agricultural Bank. Uh, the list also includes other Russian companies that play a significant role in Russia's economy, uh, including in the energy, shipping, maritime, and telecommunications industries, uh, among others. And here with respect to Directive 3, I would just note that OFAC emphasized in, in several FAQs uh, that entities subject to this Directive 3 may also be subject to other prohibitions under other sanctions authorities. Uh, so such as Spurbank, which is subject to the Directive 2 that I discussed earlier, uh, or the sector specific directives that were previously issued under um, Executive Order 13662 in connection with uh, the Crimea related sanctions. So it's important to keep in mind, particularly with respect to these debt and equity restrictions, uh, that there may be a number of sanctions authorities at, at play with respect to any particular entity. And then finally, just yesterday, President Biden issued a new executive order prohibiting the importation of, of crude oil and certain petroleum products, liquefied natural gas and coal. Eric, I think, is going to discuss the import prohibition aspect in a bit, but I would also just flag that uh, the executive order also prohibits any new investment by U.S. persons in Russia's energy sector and also the facilitation by, by a U.S. person, whether through financing or otherwise, of a new investment by a, a foreign person in, in Russia's energy sector. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Eric and on to Craig to uh, discuss the EU and UK investment related sanctions. Yeah, great. Over to, over to you, Craig. Thanks, Eric. So specifically in relation to um, you know, investment sanctions, in addition to the points I already discussed around um, you know, securities and, and sanctions on uh, trading in Europe. There's specific prohibition on there being any public financing or financial assistance from public bodies for trade with or investment in Russia. There are some exceptions to that for smaller projects, but um, it's pretty broad. In addition, there's a prohibition on involvement in projects which are co-financed by the Russian Direct Investment Fund. So nobody can get involved as a you know, co-financier there. And uh, the trade restrictions that we'll, we'll discuss next also are generally coupled with a ban on providing any financing or financial assistance in connection with that trade. So let's, let's move on to the, the next bucket, which is the import-export trade restrictions. Um, in the EU, there has been a significant expansion here, both in terms of the scope of goods and technology that are now covered but also um, the sort of geographical scope. So for example, where previously it might have been prohibited to provide certain goods or technology for use in Crimea and Sevastopol, um, you know, restrictions now are generally couched in terms of any export of items to or for use in Russia. Um, you know, these export restrictions are also usually coupled with an associated restriction on providing any sort of technical assistance, brokering, or other services, in addition to the 
um, targeting of financing and financial assistance that I, I just mentioned. The restricted goods uh, now range well beyond the traditional sectors of military goods, dual use goods, and as we saw specifically for Russia previously, you know, items which were uh, used for oil and gas exploration or, or refining. The latest UK list, for example, and it's, it's more or less identical to the equivalent EU list, includes uh, as restricted goods and technologies, uh, electronics, computers, uh, telecommunications equipment, navigation and avionics equipment, and extends as far as you know, individual vessels and aircraft. So we've now moved well beyond where we were two weeks ago. Now, uh, do you want to talk about the equivalent restrictions in the US, Eric? Yes, thank you, Craig. Um, let me let me do that. Uh, I'll start with the import restrictions and and hot off the press. Just announced yesterday afternoon, uh, yesterday's announcement that the U.S. will ban completely the importation into the United States of of the following energy products of the Russian Federation uh, or Russian Federation origin, I should say crude oil, petroleum, petroleum fuels, oils, and products of their distillation, LNG, coal, and coal products, all subject to a wind-down period authorized by general license that ends on April 22. This really is a major step, and it's in response to significant public pressure to act, in addition to clear congressional signaling that Congress intended to pass legislation that would do the same thing. So in, in, in many ways, the White House getting out ahead of Congress and keeping control of the issue uh, in its own uh, set of, of executive branch actions. <clears throat> but at the same time, the White House did acknowledge that there will be collateral consequences felt in the United States, both at the gas pump and otherwise and also recognize the significant costs to Europe in announcing that the US would work with Europe to develop a long-term plan to reduce reliance on Russian oil and gas. It was because of these costs that President Biden in his uh, statement accompanying the announcement of these measures acknowledged that the US was moving forward with this ban understanding that many of the European allies and partners may not be in a position to join the United States. And that's despite the close coordination that the sanctions rollout otherwise has seen. So in other words, uh, recognizing that this really isn't a gap between the US and the EU, it's really just a, a situational uh, gap and there will be efforts by Europe, and, and they've announced the same thing, to try and uh, reduce their reliance on Russian energy sources. On the export side, implementation has been with the uh, Department of Commerce and, and the uh, Bureau of Industry and Security, or the BIS. Um, over the past couple of weeks, the BIS has imposed significant and relatively complex controls on the export and re-export to, and then even transfer within Russia and Belarus of a wide range of previously uncontrolled US and foreign made items. Uh, these new license requirements and licensing policies that were added are designed to protect US national security and, and the foreign policy interests by restricting Russia's access to items that it needs to project power and fulfill its strategic ambitions, essentially trying to uh, make it much harder for Russia to produce technology items and also military items. Uh, how does that, uh, how, how does this export restriction uh, come to come into practice? I mean, it, as, as noted, it, it is very complex, but at a high level, with limited exceptions, the export from the United States and, and re-export from abroad of almost any item, software or technology that is subject to the EAR or the Export Administration Regulations and described on the Commerce Control List is going to require a license if destined to Russia or Belarus and the license generally will be denied. Um, 
the export, re-export, or transfer of any type of item, including the so-called EAR-99 items, uh, will require a license, which will be denied if there's knowledge that it will be for military end use or a military end user, um, whether listed or unlisted. And there was a, an expansion of the list of military uh, entities in the recent weeks. In addition, uh, foreign, various foreign produced items are or will be after a phase in period subject to the EAR and require a license, which will generally be denied if destined to Russia or Belarus from a country that is not committed to uh, imposing substantially similar controls. Um, and finally, there were uh, significant export restrictions imposed on technology exports that support Russia's long-term oil refining capacity, building on a uh, rule that was originally put in place in 2014. Unlike these, the, the 2014 provisions, the, the new license requirements don't include a knowledge requirement, and there's a more restrictive licensing policy modifying the pre-existing standard from presumption of denial to policy of denial. I think the important thing to note about these sanctions or export control related sanctions is that they're part of a whole of government approach to sanctions more generally that is that has come to be over the past several years. You've seen that in connection with China in particular, uh, and they do reinforce the importance of looking to BIS in the implementation of a coordinated U.S. sanctions policy and the importance of both exporters and uh, parties that support exporters in understanding these rules and, and understanding compliance. So I, I think that's that's uh, all we have for export and import. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn to the next major area of sanctions, which is targeting. Uh, we use that term to mean the designation of a person or an entity as a sanctioned person or a SDN, a specially designated national, by virtue of that designation, the, the party being so designated has all of its property and interests in property that come into the possession or control of US persons blocked. And then all US persons are prohibited from dealings with these parties. Uh, Man had already mentioned a number of financial institutions that have been targeted, but there have been uh, other targeting decisions, including Nord Stream 2 to implement the uh, uh, or further the uh, Germany's declaration that it would halt certification of the pipeline. Uh, the CEO of Nord Stream 2, various Russian entities operating in the defense sector, the materials sector, uh, technology sector, and then in the uh, uh, what the US called the disinformation sector. Uh, but most important, I think, is the designation of a number of prominent Russian oligarchs and family members. The reason I say those are most important is that these family members uh, and oligarchs own significant interests, sometimes controlling interests, in companies throughout Europe and, and even to some degree in the United States, and unraveling the consequences of these designations for the companies in which these uh, designated persons own uh, equity or otherwise control is turning out to be quite a complex situation. So uh, I think with that, maybe Craig, I, I think we're seeing this really playing out in the EU and UK, and maybe I'll turn it over to you to, to say a word about that. Yeah, thanks, Eric. And I, yeah, I mentioned sort of uh, half an hour ago or so that um, we are seeing this as a particular problem for companies where a shareholder is sanctioned, but that shareholder doesn't have 50%. You know, that's certainly a real issue uh, for a lot of European and UK companies at the minute. I think more generally, the scope of the targeting in the EU in particular has been breathtaking, where they sort of designated the entire membership of the Russian Duma, entire membership of uh, Russia's National Security Council, as well as you know, uh, Putin and Lavrov themselves. So that has... You know, and we keep saying unprecedented, but I mean, it really was un unprecedented. And, and what's interesting, particularly in the UK, where I pointed out that there has been a sort of lag because the government claims they have a bit of an issue with the designation process in the UK on the basis of our post-Brexit regulations. We are seeing steps outside of that formal sanctions 
uh, and designation process to discourage companies from doing business in Russia. Uh, there's been a stream of announcements from, from UK companies, also EU companies, um, saying that they will be exiting or suspending their, their Russian business. And I guess the most high profile example of that was the announcement that BP made that it would be you know, exiting its position in Rosneft after we saw very you know, highly publicized meeting between um, the CEO and, uh, and the British government. I mean, I think what remains to be seen is whether and, and what retaliatory action Russia is going to take as all of these companies close down their operations. There's been plenty of speculation, particularly in the Russian language press, about um, expropriation, nationalization, or even confiscation of, of the assets um, that are being left behind. Um, and in parallel with that, we're seeing uh, increasingly hostile environment for non-sanctioned people. Uh, a good example of this was in the UK. We have had a member of parliament standing up and calling for Chelsea Football Club to be taken away from Roman Abramovich, even though he's not actually been, been sanctioned in the, in the UK. Um, you know, the determination to enforce the sanctions that are in place um, and the targeting is also highlighted by the fact that yesterday the EU launched a new sanctions whistleblower tool, um, which allows anybody to simply log on to uh, a European Union website and report uh, an alleged breach of sanctions, and then that will be followed up either by, by the Commission or it will be referred to the relevant national competent authority for them to look into. So, you know, we're really seeing steps that we've never seen before in Europe to try and make sure that um, these, these sanctions are not just there, but they're also enforced. All right, and, and then Sharon, um, you know, one, one thing that uh, I, I think really is uh, also tied to these uh, oligarch des designations is the um, announcement of the uh, Klepto Capture Task Force and, and the sort of hunt for uh, assets. Can you say a little bit about that for us? Sure. So it was announced last week that DOJ had created this multi-agency task force, and its goal is to give full effect to the sanctions, and um, in particular, to focus on the Russian government officials, government-aligned elites, oligarchs, individuals and entities that are, that are aiding and concealing their illegal activity. It's treated a high level between the Department of at the Department of Justice. It's run out of the Deputy Atten Attorney General's office, and it's going to be and it is being led by a veteran money laundering prosecutor from my old office, the Southern District of New York, and includes prosecutors from the National Security Division, the Criminal Division, at DOJ, as well as various different U.S. Attorney's offices. And critically, the group is going to work in cooperation with the Transatlantic Task Force, which is a European um, Commission, UK, France, Italy, Germany, and Canada task force. So there'll be substantial sharing of information between these various different law enforcement bodies. There's essentially four components to the work of the task force. The first is to investigate and prosecute violations of um, sanctions New, the new sanctions, future sanctions, and also previous, you know, efforts to evade sanction, Russian sanctions. And these are your typical criminal prosecutions that are often go, are aligned with cases that are brought, civil enforcement actions brought by OFAC or maybe other regulators. Um, one of the other areas of focus is that they're going to be looking at combating the um, unlawful efforts to undermine restrictions taken against Russian financial institutions, including those who try and invade KYC and AML measures. So this means that the task force is actually going to be scrutinizing compliance with the U.S. anti-money laundering requirements and efforts to aid oligarchs and others in thwarting those restrictions. So <clears throat> this, is, this is something that um, financial institutions should pay attention to. Their compliance with AML obligations are going to be something that, <clears throat> excuse me, can be the subject of the task force's investigation. How banks identify sanctioned parties, their nominees, associates, and in particular, um, suspicious activity reporting. For a group like the task force, the SARS that are filed are going to be critical to the identification of 
individuals that are involved in sanctions violations, identifying assets, et cetera. And um, it's especially important for institutions with customers in jurisdictions where oligarchs have, are known to bank, for example, Switzerland and Israel, to be attention, pay attention to this and look to understanding their, um, their customer base. DOJ notes that they're gonna use their full, leg, lay, uh, um, full array of their legal authorities to investigate and prosecute those, um, those who aid sanctioned parties in, um, in having access to the US financial system. So this is sort of a warning call that significant AML failures or sanction failures can be criminal cases. And then the other two sort of points of their mission are, or efforts are to target the use of cryptocurrency to evade sanctions or launder the proceeds of corruption. And here, um, just yesterday, um, FinCEN came out with a um, alert and included in that alert was speaking about the, the concern about the use of cryptocurrency to evade sanctions, which includes specific red flags. So those institutions that have touch points with cryptocurrency should really focus on that. There is a warning there, as well as the concern about Russia's use of ransomware and um, to you know, target institutions in the US. And then finally, the one that seems to be getting a lot of attention is the use of civil and criminal asset forfeiture. So while sanctions have provisions to block the assets of um, sanctioned parties, <clears throat> they're blocked. They, don't, they stay there and um, they remain there in perpetuity. Forfeiture is a little different. Under forfeiture, criminal forfeiture is part of a criminal prosecution, but civil forfeiture is a separate action against the property and it's a civil proceeding. And at the end, the US government, if they win, they take title to the property and can do things with the property. So it's clear that, um, that DOJ, part of their mission is to use that civil forfeiture in conjunction with those sanctions to take away that property from oligarchs. And that you, those suspicious activity reports, et cetera, that will be filed by financial institutions are gonna be critical to help DOJ to be able to identify those assets. Great. Well, look, we've covered a lot of ground over the past uh, 50 minutes or so. And as we approach the end of our hour, we'd just like to talk about a couple of additional topics that will be critical for financial institutions and global industry as we move forward. And those are enforcement, what's next in sanctions, and then particularly with respect to U.S. law, the prospect for secondary sanctions and congressional involvement through new legislation on the secondary sanctions question there, that was uh, already addressed in the, in the chat questions. So you may take a look at that, but Sharon, can you just start us off with your expectations on enforcement and, and maybe a word, brief word about the FinCEN advisory we saw uh, earlier this week? I'm sure. So <clears throat> as I just mentioned previously, I think there are really going to be heightened focus on um, compliance with the uh, Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering requirements. There's an expectation right now that financial institutions, banks, broker dealers, and really others are reviewing their customers, looking at who they are, assuring that they know who their customer is, and they understand those customer relationships and what their business is, and that they're alert to any kind of suspicious activity that's going on. FinCEN came out with an advisory yesterday that includes, and I encourage financial institutions, as I'm sure they do, look at those red flags, but they include red flags, which could be indicative of suspicious activity identifying um, you know, potential sanctions investigation. So it's gonna be important that, um, that financial institutions heed those warnings, look at, those, uh, at their connections with crypto companies and be alert to that because what happens is if, you know, not immediately, but, you know, subsequently, if there are failures and if there are misses, and frankly, there will be misses. The, um, the Russian oligarchs have had 20 years to be able to, you know, perfect their ability to hide their assets. They're not going to, they're not easy to find, and it's going to be challenging for financial institutions. But what's important is that the, um, you have a strong and effective anti-money laundering program, that you have proper governance around your whole processes, and that, um, that in, and looking at that in that light. 
Normally, it's, while it's important to file suspicious activity reports, and oftentimes it's hard to, you know, there'll be judgment calls. This is a situation where I think in, if you're looking at the scale, the scale is weighing heavily on filing, that you want to be able to, you know, be part of the, you know, the solution, helping the government to, you know, to be able to thwart sanctions evasion. Um, Craig mentioned that there is a, um, a whistleblower provision in the UK. Well, there's similarly something in the US. There is a um, kleptocracy um, asset rewards program, which also uh, provides a, um, that Department of Treasury can pay a reward to individuals or entities who help identify and recover assets leaked to foreign government corruption. So the uh, klepto capture task force may be getting some assistance from the public or you know, from others with knowledge to be able to point out assets of, um, klepto, of um, people that are violating sanctions or oligarchs that have hidden assets. But I think it's gonna be a hot, you know, a white hot AML enforcement environment. Great, all right. And then Adam, I think uh, we'll turn to you for the sort of the last word on, uh, on sort of where we go from here. Um, in terms of both sanctions and and potentially secondary sanctions. Sure. So, you know, I would just jump off of Sharon's last point, which is the coming oligarch asset hunt. I was at Treasury when we were deploying the first round of oligarch sanctions in 2014 and 2015, and I will be candid, we had limited success in piercing the corporate veils that Sharon is talking about and finding these assets hidden within shell companies and trusts. I think this effort is going to be much more successful, both because of the rewards that are being offered, because you have more jurisdictions, including Switzerland, cooperating with the sanctions effort this time, and because I think the level of government resources from the law enforcement, treasury, intelligence community is just unprecedented. So uh, I think this will look qualitatively different. In terms of what's coming for additional sanctions, I'm expecting additional Russian banks to be targeted. I don't think it's wrong to be expecting the end game in, in the near term to be a comprehensive cordon on the Russian economy and banking sector, similar to what we have on Iran or North Korea. I think likewise, we're likely to see reductions in the permissible credit and financing maturity terms. Currently at 14 days in the US, I expect that to go to zero. Um, we haven't yet seen the sanctions announced on various Russian critical sectors metals, mining, aviation, shipping, industrial equipment, technology, and software. Of course, the sanctions have already impacted those in various ways, but this is sort of a standard part of a comprehensive sanctions program, and I think that will be built out. And uh, finally, the secondary sanctions that Eric referred to. This isn't something that the U.S. executive branch traditionally favors. Of course, these types of sanctions go down very poorly, internationally with other countries, but Congress has turned to secondary sanctions again and again in the last 10 years. And if they're looking for a way to uh, add materially to what the Biden administration has done, there aren't that many places they can go because the Biden administration has covered so much ground, has been so aggressive in such a short amount of time. And so I think we do have to keep an eye out for secondary sanctions, despite the immediate tensions those would produce with India with China in terms of their energy imports and in terms of their banking system. All right, thank you very much, Adam. And thank you to all of our attendees. We had uh, just a, a really great uh, amount of participants and we appreciate all of your interest. We do hope that you learned something, that you enjoyed your hour and that you will reach out to us if there's anything that Sullivan and Cromwell can help you with in respect of these matters. But goodbye for now and thanks again.